Well, welcome, everyone. This is a big day. A couple things happened. Yesterday was the first day, if you were a freshman member, that you've been in the Capitol on the floor and you didn't have to wear a mask. And I think this is really the first day that we've been able to allow to bring real people into the Capitol. So we want to thank you all for being here. And normally, on a State of the Union, we members all get to bring somebody from their district. And what's great about that is you, you got real people with real challenges, being able to communicate with one another. And what we thought we would do is, in this world that we live in today, try to have a real State of the Union here. There are so many challenges that are happening um, in our world and in our country. I mean, and so much has changed just in a year. I mean, inflation, we haven't had like this in 40 years. Crime rising in every community based upon policies about defunding the police. Um, the border. I mean, there's so many elements of the border just opening it wide. People on the terrace watch list. Fentanyl coming across the border. It's like every single community in America is now a border city. And so what we wanted to do, and energy. I mean, here we were, energy independent. We look what's happening in Ukraine today. Had we stayed, Russia would have less money. We could help Europe more. I mean, we want to make sure we change the course of history of where we are right now. And so what we wanted to have is a discussion about this. And um, we've got quite a few members here that can help us. We've got some great experts across the country. Um, we've got Elise Stefanik, who is an amazing member of Congress, who has this beautiful son, Sam, who, look, I have two children, but I've never seen a child smile so much as Sam does. He's six months old. He's fabulous. And his mom has fabulous shoes. I love those shoes. I just saw those. But Elise, why don't we turn it over to you? You can introduce the first guest and start our discussion. Absolutely. Thank you, Leader McCarthy. And thank you to all of you from across America who are here today. You are here to talk about the real State of the Union, which is in crisis. One of the crises that I hear about in my district is the border crisis. And we believe that every state, every community in this country is a border state and a border community. And I'm excited to introduce my friend, Brandon Judd, who is president of the National Border Patrol Council, who is really on the front lines and represents tens of thousands of brave men and women who are addressing this crisis on the southern border. Brandon, honored to turn it over to you. Chairwoman, thank you. Leader McCarthy, thank you. Chairman Scalise, thank you very much. Nice socks, by the way. <laughs> we put on a uniform every day uh, to go out and do the job because we want to protect the American public. That's why we do it. Um, under this administration, we're, we're beaten down. The morale is the lowest that we've ever seen before. Um, it's very difficult to put that uniform on. If it wasn't for the love of our fellow citizens, we just wouldn't be able to do it. When you look back at 2017, we had 310,000 apprehensions. That number rose sevenfold in 2021 to nearly 2 million apprehensions. The problem with that is the cartels, they use illegal immigration to flood our resources. It pulls us out of the field. It creates artificial gaps in our coverage. When it creates those gaps, they're then allowed to run their higher value products, such as fentanyl, uh, criminal aliens, and aliens from special interest countries. Um, it's a huge problem, and, it, and it's just not solvable. This is a man-made crisis. It's simply because this administration took away all of the policies that President Trump implemented that were so beneficial to border security. And because of that, we're seeing something that is completely and totally out of control. If the Republicans take back the House, and the Senate in 22, what policies will you implement to help us get the border under control so that we can protect the American public, which is what we want to do? We are committed to securing the border, and one of our members on the front lines has been a leading voice in this. I want to introduce Tony Gonzalez from Texas 23. I think Tony represents, what, more than 42% of the entire border? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, little chunk of the border. <laughs> um, Stand up, Tony. Stand up, Tony. Yes. Yeah, a little chunk of the border. I represent 42% of the southern border, over 800 miles. Uh, appreciate the question. Appreciate everything you've done, Brandon, uh, for, uh, for uh, advocating for our Border Patrol agents. And yes, they are tired. Uh, it is as bad as it's ever been, and it hasn't gotten any better. I'm on the border every single week. Like many of our colleagues, we've all been out there. Uh, so, you know, to your question, what are, what are Republicans going to do? I think there's three things in particular that we're going to do. Uh, the first thing is we're going to hold hearings, right? We're going to have a nice parking spot up front for Secretary Mayorkas to come down to, the, down to the House 
and hold hearings, and we're going to hold him accountable uh, because it's his organization that he's leading on this. So we can do that on day one, and, and uh, a lot of us have committed to doing that. So one is hearings. Two is the intelligence piece. You know, um, you mentioned the numbers, and I'm a numbers guy, too. I'm a cryptologist by trade. Cyber's my expertise. Uh, numbers matter. You know, last year, there were 4,103 Russians that came over our border illegally. How many of those are bad actors? How many of those are a national security threat to our country? You know, we always think it's never going to happen to us until it happens to us. I mean, Putin is, is not a good person. Right? He is backed into a corner. You never know what they're going to do. These are the type of things I think the intelligence community should be asking. We need to get ahead of a problem, uh, not behind the eight ball of a problem. And then the third thing is resources. Uh, you know, we, we got to give resources to three things in particular. One is building the wall. Look, walls work. We just got back from a trip from Israel. Walls work. Right? They're, they're, a, part, they're a fundamental piece to security. Right, so that's one. We'll get resources for that. Two, manpower. Right, you got to have boots on the ground. You got to have somebody that's on the ground doing the work. Agents are are tired. We need to raise the the overall number of agents. And then the third piece is technology. You know, right now, you know, uh, these cartels they're very sophisticated. They're using drones and they're flying these drones from Mexico to the United States. And guess what's on these drones? Fentanyl. Right? Fentanyl is small little pills. You don't need to have, you know, hundreds of pounds of marijuana we're talking about here. We're talking small little packages that they come back and forth. Our agents are seeing this. The reason why they're so frustrated is because they can't do anything about it. They have a walkie-talkie and a flashlight. Let's arm them. Let's give them some resources. Why can't we shoot these drones down? Right? They're, they're invading our airspace. Right? They're killing our children. Over 100,000 people have died from fentanyl. These are some things I think on day one Republican Party can do. One of the issues that Brandon touched upon that is so important when we think about the border is the amount of illegal drugs, specifically fentanyl, that is flooding into our country. The leading cause of death of Americans age 18 to 45 is drug overdoses. And here today we have Christy Deeroff, who's a mom whose son died from an opioid overdose. As a new mom, my heart breaks. And I want to thank you for the courage of your advocacy. And I want to turn it over to you to share your story. Is this on? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is Wes. This is my middle son. Um, I apologize because I have to read. That's all right. But um, I can tell you that once you go through, um, a, when you go through a life where your kids have struggled through addiction and it's a very difficult long period of time and then they finally die it's 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 really tough on you and you can smile and pretend like everything's fine but um i apologize i have to read because i cannot remember the words if i don't okay so um good afternoon thank you so much congressman mccarthy for the invitation to speak on behalf of the millions of american families suffering from suffering due to the fentanyl crisis my name is Christy Dyroff. I was a magistrate for 12 years in West Virginia with my husband, Rich. Um, he was a trooper. We moved to Montgomery County, Maryland when Rich began serving as a Pentagon federal police officer. And I worked as the director of communications for the National Organization for Victim Assistance, Crime Victims Rights Organization. Most importantly, I'm a mother to three ch beautiful children, Curtis, Wesley, and Kimberly. <laughs> Thank you, babe. Um, Curtis, Wesley, and Kimberly. Unfortunately, Wesley's no longer with us. As my middle child, he was always pushing to keep up with his big brother. They took, uh, his, they took his training wheels off of his tiny bike when he was two years old because he didn't want to be a baby. He mastered it immediately. Good-looking, smart, athletically very talented, Wes was not remembered uh, Wes was most remembered for his kindness. He started wrestling at five and won, for two years, he won every competition by pinning. He frequently cried while hugging his opponent after they held his arm up and, and told him that he won. He felt badly for the, the other boy. Mm. So he, uh, while a student at WVU, Wesley injured his knee playing football with his friends. 
he bega- he went to our primary care physician who for treatment. This began an increasingly slippery slope of pain pills and addiction, which overtook our lives. As a parent, there's nothing I wouldn't do to protect my children. Between HIPAA restrictions and the expansion of Obamacare, Wes was able to support his addiction for several years without our knowledge, until he failed out of college and abandoned his life to focus solely on feeding his addiction. Not until that point did he finally come to us and admit the struggle he was fighting. He moved to be near his sister then in Miami and began what I call the Florida shuffle. The the billion dollar industry moves our children through a revolving door of rehabs, IOPs, halfway houses, NA meeting sponsors, despite the endless energy, effort, heartache, and money we expended, nothing cured his disease. But he did enjoy the achievement of recovery uh, beginning in 2013. Our beautiful in 2015, my husband and I moved to coastal Georgia where Rich began a career as an instructor at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. Wesley felt he was in a fragile state of recovery in Florida at this time, so he mo- asked if he could move up with us to Georgia. We said, of course. He was always handy, so I was blessed to spend most every day living and working with him for six months as we remodeled our new home. We were so proud of him. He had started his own remodeling business, had a lovely fiance, Crystal. He was living in his own home and was turning his whole life around. He came over for dinner and we had a sweet family evening. His last words to Rich and I were, I love you, I'll see you in the morning. When he didn't, we rushed to his house to discover what every, parent, every parent's worst nightmare. Wesley was gone. He had died immediately with the needle and powder packets still next to him. I grieved this stumble that took his life. I cried that wail that comes from so deep inside you, you don't recognize it, like a mortally wounded animal. After no advas- investigation was happening locally, I found a DEA drug task force in Orlando where Wesley had traveled to buy the heroin. I was able to provide them with the website, the Experience Project, that that is owned by the Ultimate Software Group. Hugo Marganet Castro used the handle Pothead Juice on a page titled Heroin, 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 where he and countless others openly offered heroin most any pills you could think of for sale. The drug task force arrested him within two weeks. He admitted to making well over 100 previous sales in 2015 before Wesley's. Um, He knew they were not heroin. They were pure fentanyl. Over 100 times stronger than than what people thought that they would get. Um, He's now serving a 20-year sentence in federal prison for murdering Wesley. That means thousands of other families aren't suffering because of him. Um, He, I believe, was the um, first fentanyl prosecution through the the, um, USA, uh, through the U.S. Attorney's Office. Yes. Um, And interestingly enough, that it has a minimum of, it has a a minimum of 20 years to life, the sentence. And although both, excuse me, both the prosecutor and the defense asked for, because he had pled to the charge, they asked for a reduced sentence. The judge gave him 20 years. Um, our children should be saved. Parents shouldn't have to worry that just by clicking through a few sites, they can buy a drug. Any drug. And have it delivered. Parents should be able to trust their children to be safe from heroin. This past year, over 100,000 Americans one every 11 minutes dies from opioid poisoning. The surge in deaths is squarely related to our failure to secure the southern border. The only thing necessary for you to triumph is forgiveness. And my question is, what is going? How? What do you think are the priorities to be able to 
to stop this. We've had a 30 percent increase in fentanyl deaths since last year. So obviously, as we've had more people coming in, it, I mean, this isn't a shell game. We all understand it is what it is. Um, COVID is not the issue. Fentanyl is the issue. And every one of us in this room, I can promise you, knows someone. They, and if they say they don't, then they're not being honest. They have a family member, a coworker, a friend, or a neighbor who either has died from it or who is struggling through addiction. So this, again, this is a man-made crisis. If we don't get the wall secured, it's just going to get worse. So is that the answer? Or is prosecution, if, if we're going to catch and release these criminals, then that's not going to help either. Because if there's too much profit in it, they're going to continue to do it. So I'm just curious what ideas Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to recognize our ranking Republican member, Kathy McMorris Rogers, who's been working on this issue for many, many years. And thank you, Christy, for sharing your story. She's the ranker of energy and commerce. First of all, I just want to give you a hug. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, thank you for being here. Thank you. So sorry for your loss. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my goodness. You walked in and I said, you look like my sister. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, Christy, thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for advocating for so many others. Thank you for being here. 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 Thank you we know, we know where it's coming from. We know that it's been coming from China, the chemicals through Mexico, and across the southern border. And you said it so well. We need to secure the border. That's pretty, pretty fundamental to a sovereign nation is that you have a, 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 a secure border to protect people. And in this case, to protect our children to protect our friends and neighbors <clears throat> from, from fentanyl. It's, you know, enough fentanyl is, uh, so just, it, it's enough fentanyl on the ear, uh, on Lincoln's ear on a penny. Exactly, three grains. Yeah, will kill someone. Um, and I, like so many, it's, it's uh, shocking how many people, how many stories. Uh, it's uh, the number one killer of 18 to 45 year olds. And so we, we must take action. We have the Stop Fentanyl Now Act, which would permanently schedule fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. And that's, that's what needs to pass because over the last two years in particular, um, we've seen the increase in fentanyl coming across the border. And it was the Trump administration that put an emergency order in place for, for fentanyl and fentanyl analogs because what they do is they change just the mixture a little bit. So then the fentanyl isn't a, an illegal substance and they can bring it across the border. So DEA has been operating under an emergency order and it expired in May. We can't get it permanent right now. It's being blocked. And so we're at, it's, it's, we've gotten these short-term extensions over the last, since May. And we need to get it permanent. We need to permanently schedule fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. It runs out March 11th. And we've been. Um, the Department of Energy, at, they have scientists at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory that they study fentanyl. And they, and they actually, actually try, try to, to come up with, with different, different analogs that, that are possible. They keep it in what they call a journal so that they can inform law enforcement what they're dealing with. Because it, with changing one or two molecules, it can change completely. And then, for that to not be illegal, you still kill someone. So that is scary. Um, they were estimating that there are hundreds of millions of chemical variants uh, that are analogs, and some are so potent that an amount would be larger than they're single. So that's, and a lot of people don't understand that that analog 
because she was out there. Yes. 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 That's, That's why, why the permanent, permanent scheduling, scheduling for the analog spent on analog is so important. important. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, I, I, I just met a mom in Spokane who lost her 23-year-old son the day after Thanksgiving. And he bought a pill on Snapchat, thinking he was buying Xanax for his anxiety. And it was laced in fentanyl, and it killed him in that instant. And like your son, had his whole life ahead of him. Great kid, and it's just heartbreaking. And unfortunately, this story is repeated too many times right now. And it just underscores the importance of securing our border and, and holding you know, giving law enforcement the tools so that they can actually hold these people accountable. The guy that sold this pill has not been held accountable. He's still, he's still there selling pills. So we are, this is one of our top priorities. We are, we are committed to the permanent scheduling of fentanyl, fentanyl analogs, continuing to do the research, but this is one of the many ways or one of the main ways that we must uh, protect protect our children and protect our families here in the United States. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your story. The crisis, of course, it's always the family first, but law enforcement officers. And you talk to any county sheriff, certainly in my district, they will tell you about the uptick in these tragic, heartbreaking stories. We have Sheriff Richard Jones here today from Butler County, Ohio. Uh, and our law enforcement officers have been under huge, huge strain and challenges, especially given the Democrats' defund the police rhetoric and policies over this past year. We as House Republicans stand strongly with our law enforcement. So I want to turn it over to Sheriff Jones. Yes, thank you. Why did we know you would be the sheriff? With the cowboy hat. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't need a badge, you just need the hat. I'm the only one in D.C. that has a cowboy hat. It's easy for the staffers to find out. Let's see. We've been under attack. It's unbelievable. We can't even hire policemen uh, and police women. They won't even take the test. Do you blame them? Um, and they're under such scrutiny. They do their job. They don't want to put them in prison. We can't even buy bullets anymore. You can't get them. You know, there's such a shortage of bullets. Now we're going to have a shortage of gas. You know what we're going to end up doing? We're going to have less patrol because we can't afford gas. Fuel. We've had fentanyl. A friend of mine, his daughter died. Murphy's in, in Butler County. Really a sad situation. Uh, it destroys the family. We have fentanyl coming across the border disguised in baby aspirin. I want to repeat that. They're disguised in baby aspirin. They have, they have no morals when they bring this stuff across. They know they're going to ship it and put it into the hands, and they're going to cause people to die. They want us to die. The drug cartel actually develops customers. They have a drug called cheese, and it's to develop grade school kids. They can use their milk money to buy this. It's not to make them high. It's to develop customers. And here we are with our heads in the sand. We can't hire police officers. We got no, the, the, they've made, the Democrats have made police the, the enemy. They can't change that. They, they've looked at them and demonized them. These police officers, when they do their job every single day, they have to go home. They're shot at. They return fire. They're not even allowed to return fire. I've had three babies born in my jail. Just three. Don't sound like many. Thousands of jails throughout the United States. These three babies were born addicted to drugs. Coming from Mexico. Three babies. Their little legs quiver and shake. We can't even in law enforcement, we can't even get a call. Our leader in law enforcement, in the Sheriff's Association, there's 3,300 sheriffs, can't even get a call to the White House. We get a staffer that's 22 years old, can't even get a call to the President of the United States. When President Trump was there, he was surrounded with law enforcement. Saw these hats at the White House a lot. Police chiefs, sheriffs, law enforcement. Here in Ohio, if you don't think the border is a problem, Larry Devers, who was the sheriff in Cochise County, I've been to the border. He told me they don't stay here. They come to the inside of the United States. They come everywhere. They ship them in in the middle of the night. They bus them in. They're in my jail. I put a sign up once. If anybody didn't know where they was at, it pointed to the Butler County Jail, said, they're here if you want them. 
So, my question for you is, will the Republicans help us fight the border issues and help us with our law enforcement and our community? That's my question. Absolutely, and to answer that even further, Jim Jordan, a ranking Republican on judiciary. Uh, thank you, Elise. Uh, Sheriff, good to see you. It's, uh, as you said, it's not easy being in law enforcement uh, these days, so we appreciate what you do and all the folks in law enforcement um, do. And Sheriff Jones, even though he's from Butler County, Warren Davidson's district, he is known throughout our state uh, as doing great, great work, so we appreciate you, uh, you being here. It's all driven by bad policy. I mean, the, the reason we are where we are is you know, when you defund the police, you shouldn't be surprised when you get more crime. When you don't have bail, you shouldn't be surprised when you get more crime. When you, don't ha when you have prosecutors who don't put bad guys in jail, you shouldn't be surprised when we get more crime. It's just common sense policy. I heard Brandon talk about this all the time. Bad policy leads to bad outcomes. Look at the border. When you allow 2 million people to come into the country, you're going to get bad outcomes. That's what the Biden administration has done. When you quit building the wall, when you get rid of the Remain in Mexico policy, you're going to have bad outcomes. So... Republicans are committed to doing the right thing, to doing the common sense thing when it comes to law enforcement, when it comes to our border, and to stopping the drug flow that happens as a result of a border that's not secure. Um, I, would, I would hope Joe Biden tonight would go up there and say, I'm going to reverse every stupid policy I've done. <laughs> I don't think he'll do that because his party is controlled. But this is so important for us to understand. His party is now controlled by the left, and they won't let him, even if he wanted to do it. So the only way we get this back is for the American people to make a change, and I think they're fixing to do that this November. There's a great line in the, uh, in the opening scene of the movie 1776. John Adams is in the bell tower, and he starts walking down the steps into that hall where they drafted the Declaration of Independence that hot summer. And as he walks in, he opens up the movie by saying this. He says, one useless man is a disgrace, two are a law firm, and three or more are a Congress. And I, have, and I have had it with this Congress. I think the American people have had it with the stupid policies they see coming from the Democrat-controlled Congress and the Biden administration. And they are itching, they are fixing to make a change and put the Republicans back in charge and make Kevin McCarthy Speaker of the House. And that's what we got to focus on. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, Jim. And uh, Sheriff, your member is here. Warren's in the back. It's actually his birthday, so he does a great job. But um, one thing I would tell you, and it, it goes all the combination here, and it's thing, some of the things that Jim talked about. And if you, wanted, if you want that canary in the coal mine is America waking up, I'm, I'm from California. And in Los Angeles, they elected a DA. And we've watched this before, where Soros has gone and elected these DAs. That they're going to pick and choose what law they want to uphold. That's not their job. Their job is to uphold all laws. They're now recalling him based upon those actions. And I will tell you, it doesn't matter what spectrum you're on because every single American wants to feel safe. And you asked us what we're going to do. I promise you this. We won't defund the police. We'll add to the police. And what we'll do, too, is we're looking at, because a lot of this is a local issue and also a state issue, but what can we do federally? I mean, I think back to what Ronald Reagan did when he wanted to, to raise the age of drinking, right? But it's a state issue. He said, you can have transportation money as long as your drinking age is 21. I'm not telling you how to change, your, change the age, but maybe go. What about when we do these cop grants? You can have the cop grant money as long as your DA doesn't pick and choose and upholds all laws. And when, when it comes to fentanyl, that story is everywhere. And You know, it's an addiction. It, it, it's a disease. And it, it's not your son's fault. Your son got, Jim Jordan didn't tell you, but that guy's, your son probably looked up to him. That guy's a champion wrestler. What, what were you, 162-1 and one or something? I mean, and his son's already, he's run a camp like that. I mean, they're known as great wrestlers, but you get hurt. And he went to the doctor, prescribed something that made him an addicted to it, and he continued further. But he didn't know that was fentanyl in it. And what's happening because of the border, and where does it start? In China. I'll tell you, before COVID hit, there was a group of senators who went to China, and they were having a meeting with this general in the military. And he starts lecturing him. He says, America, you're weak. You're weak because you believe in God and you take fentanyl. Who brings us the fentanyl? It comes from China, and it only is able to come into America because our borders are been opened up. And they bring it through in a water bottle. How, 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 are you, 
how can you find with all these people coming and, and you don't, it's hot, they have a water bottle, you don't know. And now what we're finding, because you have so much, they're lacing it. So it doesn't matter where you live, you don't have to live along the border, any place in America. College campuses, and they're, just like what Kathy said, they're going on SNAP and they think they're buying something else and they're waking up dead. And it doesn't matter what family you are, it's going to touch all of you. So we have to do more than just the border. We've got to go after China. We've got to secure our border. We've got to go to the DAs. And we've got to provide the resources so you could do your job because people don't want to go do the job anymore. And do you blame them of being an officer risking their lives and then get blamed for? Um, I think you'll see a major turnaround. So, yes. And it's not just American families want to feel safe in their community. They financially want to feel secure. And we haven't had inflation like this in 40 years. And what inflation is, is a tax on every single American. And it really hurts. I mean, it was shocking to me when I watched President Biden said inflation was temporary. It's not a big deal. It's not something to be worried about. You go to the grocery store. You go to the gas station. It's no matter... You try to buy an avocado. It doesn't matter what you're buying. The price is rising. And what that means when something costs more, you've got to do without something else. And people are making choices. So what I want to turn to is Patrice, a mom of three boys, two of which are under the age of four. I want you to tell me where you're noticing these prices rise day in and day out. Thank you. I'm Patrice, and thank you so much for hosting this forum. I work with the Independent Women's Forum. We are an organization of women who speak to women and speak to the issues that expand our opportunity and our freedom. And, you know, as a, as a mom of three, I have two toddlers. I buy a lot of milk. And over the past year, like many families, I have spent at least a dollar or more per gallon uh, compared to this time last year. And I think the rising prices are something that are, it's a struggle. I mean, when you consider that inflation is up 7.5%, Real wages, which is what people get to take home every day, is down 2.4%. So that means your purchasing power is lower than before. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's a struggle. Now, you mentioned the White House. The administration has said this was transitory. I was born in 1982, so I have not seen inflation like this, and I think many millennials can agree with that. Uh, we don't believe it anymore because it, we're now six months into this, and, and there doesn't seem to be any um, stopping to this inflation problem. We've also heard that, you know, uh, that increased federal spending is going to be the solution. Build back better. That's apparently supposed to, the trillions of dollars are supposed to, I don't know, magically make our inflation um, reduce. We, you know, that's, for most regular people, that doesn't make sense to them. And I don't think it makes sense as an ec economist who looks at these numbers on a regular basis. So my question is, you know, connect the dots for the American people between this idea that massive federal spending, increased federal spending is going to somehow slow inflation. And then also when I consider how much it costs just to fuel my car and get me to work on a regular basis, you know, how it's not connected to energy policies that were, that were reverted or changed on day one of the Biden administration. So please connect the dots for everyone. And then also, what, does the, what do Republicans plan to do uh, if, you be, if you take over at the next year? I don't know where you live, but I'd like to recruit you to run for Congress. So, <laughs> fabulous. But th that's exactly what you're talking about. Buying milk every day, seeing it. I'm going to bring in an expert here. This, this Congressman, Brian Stile, he's got a great smile, but he is one of the smartest men I've ever met. Um, and what, the Democrats created this committee. It was a select committee on economic disparity and fairness. And they packed it with every socialist they had. And so I went to Brian and I said, I'd like you to serve on this because... Not as he just an economist and others, he understands what the average person goes through every single day, but he could put it in, in perspective. And I thought he would be upset like I was mad at him to do that. This guy walks in every day happy because he wants to have that debate. Um, Brian, why don't you answer a few of her questions? Thank you very much. First off, thanks for buying milk. I'm from Wisconsin, so you can't, you can't <laughs> buy enough milk. So that's a good thing. But we got to get prices under control because what you're saying is impacting moms and dads all across the country. Inflation's a tax on everyone, as Leader McCarthy said, but it really clobbers low-income workers and seniors on fixed incomes. And I can't tell you how many moms and dads are frustrated when they go to fill up their car with gas and see the gas prices going up. They go to the grocery store, bills are more expensive. Everything they're doing, the costs are going up. What can we do? One, I think we should take pride in the fact that we stopped Build Back Better. The Democrats wanted to continue down a path towards more spending and removing the dignity of work. What we need to be working to do is rip the Band-Aid off the COVID-era policies, get workers back to work, 
and get our spending under control. In the House of Representatives, we control the purse strings. We can control the spending and get a path to get ourselves back to balance. The other piece we need to do is unwind the energy policies of the Biden administration. Starting on day one, the Biden administration sent a signal to everyone in the United States that they were opposed to oil and gas being produced here in the United States when they killed the Keystone Pipeline. That was the signal that they sent, and it's not only made gas and energy more expensive, including home heating bills this winter, which are up 60% for the average family in Wisconsin. Not only has it done that, it's made our national security less secure as we see ourselves importing oil from Russia. So we have an opportunity to unwind the Biden administration's energy policies. We have to rip the Band-Aid off the COVID-era policies. We have to get workers back to work. We have to get our spending under control. And we can do that when we have Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And one of the parts you raised early on about the spending, one of the first things the Democrats did when they took over everything was to spend $2 trillion. They called it a COVID bill, but only 9% went to COVID. And remember, when when Omicron came back and no one could find test kits, you just spent $2 trillion, but none of it was available there. And we warned them it would cause inflation. That's exactly what they did. And what Brian was talking about, these policies, what the Democrats do, is a lot of the programs will have a work requirement. They remove the work requirement. And then they create an incentive for you to stay home and so you can make more money by not working in the process. And then that makes small businesses have to pay more to try to even get somebody to work. And could you imagine it? Look, I started a small business when I was 20. And there's three lessons I always learned. I was the first to work, last to leave, and last to be paid. But could you imagine owning a small business going through COVID? And then you got government paying people more to not go through. And you're just a small business trying to struggle. And so we've got a small business owner here. Um, Joe Samus, he's a co-founder and owner of Flags of Valor. And you're trying to struggle through everything with COVID, government competing with you. You're making orders to try to sell something, but your prices of your supplies are going up. You got to try to pass it on, but how do you pass it on when it changes every time you order some new supply? It's very difficult. So you end up eating some of it. And it's just so difficult. So... Um, Joe, tell us a little about some of the challenges facing as a small business. Thank you, Leader McCarthy. Uh, I want to say first that plenty of leaders talk about wanting to hear from the people, and you actually do it. This isn't the first time that you've hosted these events. You do it almost every day, so thank you for that to all of you. Um, I'll also say it's not all bad. There's one good thing. There's a lot of demand out there. So if you're a small business that can actually deliver on the demand, uh, good for you. The problem is almost no one can. So you're constantly bouncing between, I can't find the staff I need, or you're stealing staff from somebody else, so it's a net zero win for the community. You can't get the supplies you need, or you're dealing with runaway inflation, so you're bouncing between each of those. So almost every day you change your business model. It's Tuesday, I'm gonna use the Tuesday model. This will work. Tomorrow will be something different, so you're constantly recreating yourself. So it's, a, it's like there's no end in sight. And so the last, the last thing I'll say is with policy decisions that are made, the small business community is being looked at like they're almost the villains. If you're an employer, like, well, you've got it all figured out. You don't need any help. Well, small businesses account for almost 50% of jobs in America, and they account for the majority of net new jobs in America. So if you continue to allow, this isn't your party, sir, but if you continue to see policies enacted that are destroying small business, um, they're not going to survive. So what can be done to help alleviate some of the inflation problems, some of the workforce problems to, to give us a break? Any of the members want to take that or want me to take that? All right. The first thing we could fundamentally do is create the incentive to work and create the incentive to open a small business instead of the punishment of it. Because what you'll find a lot of large businesses like more regulation because then they create a monopoly. I'm looking at Kevin Hearn right here. I'm going to put him on the spot because this is a guy who started a lot of small businesses with little or nothing. And a lot of you go through the drive through sometimes of a McDonald's. He built it up into a pretty good family business. He serves on ways and means. But I remember talking to him in the middle of COVID, not knowing what was going to happen, not knowing whether he was going to get his supplies, knowing the struggle of what, it, what he was going through and others seeing it. Um, you want to touch a little on this there? Thank you, uh, future speaker Kevin McCarthy. I like your first name. It's a great name. <laughs> you know, we have a lot of small business owners in the room and uh, folks that come through and talk to us. And, you know, People ask, you know, what are you going to do about it? The first thing I did was I ran for Congress as a small business person, person that spent 35 years in 
all kinds of small businesses, uh, McDonald's restaurants, uh, manufacturing, and all kinds of things like that. So I've experienced it. And the reason I ran was because of the fact that the biggest competitor we had to small business was big government. And what we've seen the escalation in the last year, which is just insane, nobody could have ever imagined how bad it was going to be. We thought we could, but nobody's ever seen this. The only place we've ever seen what we've seen the last year is in other countries called communist countries, where there's been a complete takeover of workers and their desire to work. Uh, we, we're going to hear from our friend here at Big Board in a minute, I'm sure, but um, you know the things that's happened in our, with our mayors that we've seen across the country and the impact that they've had on forcing mass mandates and what they've done to declaring somebody an essential worker or an essential business, regardless of how you started that business or where you started that business or how long it's been in your family, you were shut down overnight. And this continued and continued. And you know, people ask, what are we going to do? We have to have a resurrection of the importance of small business in America. Because I don't care what business you look at in America, how big it is, it all started, they all started as a small business in somebody's garage, backyard, dorm room. A lot of people quit school, started these ideas, take these ideas, took a thousand bucks and started it. We have to protect what we call the opportunity to chase the American dream. No guarantees, only the opportunity to, to try and fail and get back up and do it time and time again. And I'll give you this little peek under the tent of some of the things we got to do. I'm also the co-chair of the Small Business Caucus. And we have to call out the hypocrisy of our colleagues across the aisle, the Democrat Party, who say they love small business, who go back to your districts across America and say we love small business. And the way I prove that is I'm on the Small Business Caucus, they tell their constituents. And then they come back up here, and every single vote they cast is against small business. And time and time again, I've been host on special guests on like the National Federation of Independent Business. And I say, I'm sure I'm getting ready to make half of your people mad, but I'm calling out every single Democrat that's on here. You need to hold your representative accountable to support you. This is ridiculous. We're crushing the very idea of what it means to be an American, to take this opportunity and be able to be the next big company in America. And so you're going to see that. Leader McCarthy has held countless of these time kind of town halls, and we could have them virtually, but we've done it. I know some of you have been here before, and, and it's encouraging to see what we're going to do as a Republican Party. And we're still going to have somebody in the White House that is hypocritical and his thoughts and comments on small business, and we're going to have to continue to push because we cannot destroy this thing that we call the American dream. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. What's so great is... Congress is made up of a microcosm of society. So you have people who've been in the exact same shoes that you have, and that's the great thing of why this country is, and so we get some really good feedback, and I appreciate the questions. I want to turn it over to Steve Scalise, our whip, um, who's focused on energy in many different areas. He runs the heat team and others, but Steve, you want to take over? Thanks, Kevin. And first, it's so good to see people, real people from America in the people's house in the United States Capitol. For the last two years, Speaker Pelosi has shut the Capitol down to the public. And that's something that's so discouraging because we need to have that citizen engagement and to have people here, especially on the eve of the president giving a state of the union. And look, the state of the union is in crisis on so many fronts. We've heard about some of these things. Inflation continues to be devastating to families, energy prices. Putin, think about this. President Biden, by shutting American energy down, has made our country more dependent on Russia. He was actually begging Russia to produce more oil. The sad thing is, Putin did. And today, today, United States, European Union, and the UK combined are sending $700 million a day to Russia to buy their oil. Every day. That's funding his war against Ukraine. If we opened up American energy... We could supply that need that President Biden shut down, but you just think about it. When people are paying at the pump too much right now in America, but all across Europe, not only is it hurting families, it's funding Putin's war. $700 million a day he makes from the sale of oil. We should shut that down. I want to talk about the mandates and the shutdowns of the economy. And this kind of follows up on what Kevin Hearn was just talking about, Leader McCarthy, what Elise talked about. I think we're going to look back years from now and talk about the devastating damage they did to our kids by shutting schools down. When the science says 
schools should be open. All the science, not only does it say schools should be open, the science says kids are being damaged long term. Just cognitive learning, facial expressions that you're not picking up with mass mandates. Uh, finally, we're starting to see more and more schools open up and remove the mask mandates, but it's not across the board. Uh, I want to feature, I'll start, and I know we're going to talk to small business owners and parents, but we actually have a student here. Where is Addison George? Addison. In Illinois, she had the guts to take on Governor Pritzker and these mandates that are hurting her ability and all of her classmates' ability to learn. She actually stood up. She's been featured on Tucker Carlson and other national shows because people are looking for others that have courage, and especially from our youth, because it's your generation that's the most affected. Millions of kids that aren't getting the learning opportunities that they deserve. I want to hear from Addison. Tell us your story, Addison. Come on up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I have been doing remote. Well, not been doing remote. Well, come on up here so the cameras can see you. Okay, come okay. turn around. Come on, come on okay. over here. Um, okay. I had to do remote school for over a year um, where I was sitting in my room alone at my desk, staring at a computer screen, um, not retaining any information. I couldn't talk to any of my friends for over a year. Um, and then finally, we were able to go two to three days a week. Um, my classes had about six to seven people in it. We all had our faces covered, um, all facing forward, not really allowed to even talk to our friends six feet apart. Like, it was not school. Um, I had everything taken away from me um, that made high school high school. I couldn't go to dances. Um, my sports were shut down. Um, so I, I, for over a year, I didn't get the high school experience. Um, and then during the summer, um, the mask mandate was lifted. I could live my life again. And then suddenly, um, when school started, we were able to go five days a week. But now suddenly, we had a mask again, um, even though we didn't during the summer. So um, we were back to social distancing, wearing a mask. Um, and again, my high school experience was taken away from me. Um, and finally, people in my community got fed up. Um, and they sued for the right to not have to wear a mask. Um, and so now, at least for now, we don't have to wear masks in school, but it took way too long to get there. Um, and so um, there's studies and data from a lot of states showing that school closures, um, lockdowns, and masking kids were ineffective strategies to fighting COVID. Um, and the harms of these measures have been immense, especially for kids. Um, but elect official, elected officials in my state of Illinois don't seem to care at all. Um, my governor just said on Friday that despite the lawsuit, um, he still has the right to mask kids whenever he wants. So my question is, how can leaders like you at the federal level work to protect the rights of the individual to ensure that parents are able to make the best decisions involving their kids' education? First, let's applaud Addison for her courage. Great job. And, you know, we've been having hearings on this, and one of, one of the leaders here in Congress is, is not only a doctor, by the way, if you ever wonder if your vote counts, she got elected to Congress and maybe the closest margin in the history of America, six votes out of about 400,000, six votes made her a member of Congress and boy, is she making all six of those votes count. Uh, she has been a phenomenal leader, but she was the public health director of the state of Iowa. And so she speaks with real command because she cares about public health in medical science, not political science, which you experience in Illinois. With that, Marinette Miller-Meeks, tell us what you've been working on. Well, thank you so much. And um, Addison, I just want to commend you. Your parents must be so proud of their daughter and raising a daughter that would be vocal and look at um, what you're supposed to do in school. You know, have a hypothesis, want to research it, look into the research, get the data, and then come up with a position. Unfortunately, that's not what all elected leaders to do. And let me also say, there's a little bridge that was just reopened, the I-74 bridge, that'll bring you right into Iowa and we would be happy to have you there. <laughs> because let me contrast a little bit for you. In Iowa, just across the Mississippi River from you, our governor, Governor Reynolds, uh, when I was a state senator in 2020, uh, we looked at this issue and we looked at it very diligently and what we were going to do with schools. 
And I remember sending to all of my colleagues in the state legislature a paper by the American Journal of Pediatrics talking about the low level of transmission to almost no transmission of children for COVID-19. So we decided in Iowa to reopen our schools in the fall of 2020. Reopen schools, and then the next step was we are not going to allow mandating of children wearing masks in schools. So why would that policy exist? Safety of students, safety of teachers, and the effect it has on learning. And to each of those, there is a risk and benefit of action and inaction. And as you've already explicitly said, what does the science tell us for safety of children? Almost no transmission, especially in the elementary school. Kids don't get sick even up to high school. So what's the effect on children of masking and social distancing and locking down schools or preventing them? There's no upside, it's all downside. What's the downside? So in order to keep kids safe from COVID-19, of which most of them don't get sick, very few die, the parents can decide what their risk factor is and if in fact they need to mask or they need to social distance or not even go to school and learn virtually. What's the downside? The downside is horrific. And the fact that we have allowed that to happen in the United States and continue to happen in the United States is unconscionable. The downside, loss of learning. We knew just over the two months going into the summer of 2020 that there was almost six months of loss of learning. And not only that, Minority students, low income, those that are most disadvantaged had the greatest loss of learning. So much so that the World Health Organization said that childhood poverty has increased by 15% and will be decades until we're able to reverse that. What other downside? Not only loss of learning. The Las Vegas school system opened up last year, and I mentioned this in our education and labor and in our select coronavirus task force. Why did they open their schools? Because in 2020, between March 16th and June 30th, six students had committed suicide, and between July 1st and December 31st, 12 more students committed suicide, the youngest of whom was nine. Mm. That's tragic for us as parents, but I can't even imagine how you are in a school system knowing that you have peers who have suicidal thoughts because of depression, anxiety, and we've already heard that there are more people who have died, young people, 18 to 45, who are not at the, rate, the age group at risk for dying of COVID or getting seriously ill from drug overdoses and addiction. So the risk to students is tremendous on the downside. What about the safety of teachers? Can they mask? Certainly. Can they socially distance? Absolutely. Can they have a plexiglass cinder? Yes. Didn't we increase and put them at the top of the line for vaccinations. We absolutely did. And yet, do we still have school systems that are closed? Yes, we do. We look at what the CDC did in cherry picking data from a bad study to show that masks were effective when in fact the study showed exactly the opposite. Let me just say this unequivocally. There is no scientific data for those Democratic governors right now that are removing masks from adults to still require masks in school. That mandate should have been gone yesterday. There is no scientific data to support unmasking adults, but forcing children to remain masked. So we can protect the safety of students, we can protect the safety of adults and teachers, and then get back to teaching children and letting them learn and have a normal socialization, normal life, because indeed, you're our future and we have not done a good job of protecting your future to protect ours. Well, thanks for your leadership. And the, the city of Chicago took $2 billion to open up schools and then closed the schools. And when we called on President Biden to demand that they open the schools or give the money back, he bowed to the union bosses and let them keep the money and keep the schools closed. And this is where you're seeing parents take matters into their own hands, showing up at school boards in record numbers, running for school boards. Another parent who took matters into her own hands, is Alyssa Phelps. Alyssa Phelps served our country in the Navy, so thank you for her service to our country. But then she homeschooled her kids because she didn't want her kids to miss the vital, vital learning that wasn't happening. 
in a virtual setting. So Alyssa, thank you for joining us and why don't you share your experience? Thank you, Whip Scalise, and thank you everybody for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'd like to recognize my family for being here to support me today, especially my children. Um, they're the reason why I'm here today and the reason for this discussion. Although I wanna share a personal story, my question goes out to the congressmen and women how you can help not just us, but all parents and students and even teachers help to help make our choices for our students' educations. Like millions of American families, two years ago, our children's public school was closed in response to this pandemic. It was understandable that such drastic measures were initially taken. However, being left with no guidance, no instruction, and virtually no com communications from our school for 10 weeks was completely unacceptable approach. When virtual learning was finally presented to us, it was difficult to follow, disruptive, lacked any substantial content, and therefore was inadequate to meet my children's needs. The school's lack of initiative and inconsistency were the driving force behind our decision to start homeschooling and continue to do so today. As a Navy family, who spent many years navigating transitions, we are used to making choices and facing sacrifices, but not willing to do so at the expense of our children's education, as well as their emotional well-being. We no longer wanted to be tied to a school system that failed to meet these needs. I feel that as parents and even teachers, we know our children best, but our say was not recognized one bit. And until it is, we will continue to keep our children out of the public school system. However, I'm lucky. I have a husband that works and works hard enough that I don't have to, and I could take the opportunity to homeschool my children. But how many parents can do that? It's just not fair. So my question to you is, as members of Congress, what can you do to ensure parents and teachers have more say in a children's education and more choice on the educational content as well as the school that we choose is the best fit, not just for our individual needs, but for the whole community. I'm super excited about the Parents' Bill of Rights, to, but my question is, how will it be implemented, especially when school administrators have had such an overpowering hand in our education system so far? Also, when county school boards seemingly disregard our opinions, our parents' opinions, and our input. Well, thank you. And given back parents' control over their kids' education is a major, major issue across the country. You saw it in Virginia, but you're seeing it sweep in the country. We've been working very hard on this. Leader McCarthy's put together task forces, but one of them, in the education committee, they've been working on policies, and the leader of that is someone who was an education leader herself in the great state of Louisiana, now a, one of the newest members of Congress, but the author of the Parents' Bill of Rights, Julia Letlow. Thank you so much, Whip Scalise, and thank you, Alyssa, uh, first for your service and uh, secondly for your passion for education. Uh, like Whip Scalise said, um, it's my passion too, and that really hit home when you said that you are fortunate to, enough to have a husband that can help you uh, so you can educate your children at home. Uh, I now find myself as a single mom. I don't have that opportunity, and that's why I'm so passionate about the Parents' Bill of Rights. And, you know, the silver lining that happened from the pandemic is that there were so many of us who for the first time, just like yourself, sat down and really took a look at what our children were learning and the curriculum that they were being taught and uh, the strengths and weaknesses of it. Now, at the time, I had a newborn and a two-year-old, and so um, I wasn't really doing that, but I heard from countless of my mom friends and dad friends, don't want to leave out the dads, but really from my mom friends who said, can you believe that this is what our children are being taught? And so for the first time, it wasn't just about homework. It was about the whole curriculum and the, the whole of the experience. And um, so it became very clear uh, when I got to Congress that uh, parents need a voice. They absolutely need a voice. And we saw for the first time for, through the Virginia governor's race that parents were fed up. They were tired of not having a voice anymore, and their voices were going to be heard. That is so exciting. If you would have told me two and a half years ago that education would be one of the top five issues that Americans really care about, I would have said, no way, you're kidding. But no, it is now, and, and rightfully so. 
because education is the answer to so many of our issues. In my mind, it's the education, it's, it's, it's the answer to poverty. It's the answer to giving our children a future and opportunity to stay here and thrive here. Uh, so that's why it's an absolute honor uh, to work with my colleagues to bring forward the Parents' Bill of Rights. And for those of you who aren't familiar, I want to quickly go through the five pillars. But first and foremost, it's to be able to review your child's curriculum. That's a no-brainer. We should all have access to, to see what our children are being taught. And if you don't agree with it, then you should lawfully be, be able to go to your school board and voice your concerns. You should absolutely have that right. You should also be able to see the budget. What is your money as a taxpayer being spent on in our schools? You should also be able to protect your child's privacy. And then finally, if there's any violent activity on a campus, you should know about it, and especially if it uh, relates to your child. So uh, how we're going to implement this, this is just the first brick of the foundation of legislation that will be coming forward related to education, but I think it's a really strong brick that we're laying here. And uh, how we'll implement it, just make transparency. That's all we're asking. Make this public. Make it public for all of us as parents to see exactly what's going on in our schools because my children and so many others are counting on it. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Julia, that's great. And another expert that we have in here is Elise when it comes to education. You want to touch some on this too about choice and others? Absolutely. We also believe in school choice and we are seeing households and families being left behind. An issue that my district in upstate New York faces is when there was remote learning, a huge amount of our community in rural towns and villages did not have access to rural broadband. So when we talk about families and students that are falling through the cracks, so many of my colleagues are exactly right. It's the people who already are at a disadvantage. We need to make sure that you have educational opportunity that's not dictated by your zip code, which is why we are committed to expanding opportunity and expanding the parent's ability to make a decision for the best school that fits the needs of their kids. The other important part of this is conducting oversight on the Department of Education. When we pass the Every Student Succeeds Act, so this is a few Congresses ago, but this was the K through 12 federal bill. There's actually a requirement for the Department of Ed to get parental input on curriculum. They are not abiding by that. A Republican majority will ensure that they will. This is an issue, I'll tell you, as a new mom, I think about my son's health, the second issue I think about is his education. So we will do everything we can to not only unmask our kids, to make sure our schools stay open, but make sure that every kid, no matter where you're from, no matter what your zip code is, that you have greater choice and educational opportunity. Well, fine. we've got one more, and that is a small business owner. And again, we've seen the devastation to so many small businesses from all of these mandates. And then you watch some of these leaders in the states putting the mandates on, and they don't even live by the own mandates. You see them, they tell you, you can't go out to a restaurant with your friends. They're out at restaurants with your friends. You have to do this, but they don't do that. And I think that hypocrisy has really lit a fire. But uh, Eric Flannery owns the big board. And this was a restaurant that was really being devastated by some of these mandates and ultimately led to his fighting of this mandate, led to the loss of his business opportunity license. So, Eric, why don't you share your story with us? All right. Uh, thank you guys very much for having me here. Really appreciate it. As they said, I'm Eric Flannery. I'm a Navy veteran. Uh, I'm a proprietor of a neighborhood bar here in Washington, D.C. called The Big Board. We've been opened up for about 10 years now thanks to fantastic customers and my great coworkers. Um, we've always been a place where everybody is welcome. In December of 21, the mayor of Washington, D.C. implemented emergency orders that required us to check people's personal medical records and mask our servers. Did a little soul searching and decided that we weren't gonna do that. We were not going to participate. Um, my servers are not second-class citizens that need to wear their masks when nobody else is wearing one around them eating and drinking, and we are not agents of the government. Uh, the reaction from the city was swift and severe. Inside of three weeks, my liquor license, my business license, and my health department license were removed, and given the emergency nature of how these orders were implemented, we were not given the right to appeal. Right here in the capital city of the United States of America, 
without a vote under the guise of emergency order, we were not given the right to appeal. That's just not how our government of the people, for the people, and by the people is supposed to work. It's un-American. Uh, could we have complied? Yeah, maybe. Uh, but I have to be able to look myself in the mirror and like what I see. I, thankfully, I still can, and I do. And uh, I'm, I'm hopeful, with your all's help, that the big board's going to reopen. I really am. I think it's going to happen. Uh, but um, I don't know. It's a risk. I may lose my business. I've already lost my life savings. Um, but I will not now nor ever participate in government-sanctioned discrimination of any kind. It's immoral. It's just immoral. Um, and not only are these mandates immoral, they're also illegal. And to that end, my fantas fantastic lawyer here, Mr. Robert Alt from the Buckeye Institute, fantastically smart, really, really, really brave. He's going to speak to you guys for a little bit. Oh. And as you can see, I'm extraordinarily proud to represent Eric, who has taken a, taken a stand on this issue. D.C. ended its vaccine mandate for restaurants on February 15th, and yesterday was the last day of the mask mandate in the city. Restaurants across the city are open, and they're no longer checking vaccine IDs, and yet the big board remains closed. Why? Because Mr. Flannery, a Navy veteran, was singled out simply because he spoke up and said everyone welcome. This is only possible because D.C. has operated under a state of emergency for two years. Two years. That's not a state of emergency. That's as long as a full term of Congress. Mm -hmm. By renewing and stacking these emergency orders one on top of the other, uh, they've been able to exceed the 90-day limit, uh, and D.C. government has functionally evaded the requirements of the Home Rule Charter that ensure that Congress can conduct meaningful oversight over D.C. laws. D.C. law also, as Eric mentioned, prohibits any appeal, essentially closing the courthouse doors during the state of emergency. Accordingly, the Buckeye Institute has filed multiple demand letters and motions for reconsideration with the D.C. agencies that have suspended Mr. Flannery's operating and liquor licenses. We deeply appreciate your support in exercising oversight over the D.C. government which has issued regulations that have financially crushed small businesses like the big board during this pandemic. All right, and uh, with Robert's uh, statement there, I've got a couple questions. Uh, over the last two years during both Republican and Democratic administrations, uh, governors, mayors, and other public officials throughout this country have allowed unelected bureaucrats to impose inane and arbitrary rules which systematically rob hardworking Americans of their livelihoods and civil liberties. What are you going to do to make sure these band-aids can never again be imposed? And what oversight can you exercise over an unchecked D.C. mayor and city council which have enforced these unlawful rules under the pretext of a two-year-long emergency that otherwise shields them from congressional review? Well, appreciate all of those questions. And again, thank you for your service. And... Uh, to answer, I know Kevin Hearn, as a business person and member of Congress, member of the Ways and Means Committee, has been working on a number of these fronts. Eric, I want to I want to say to you, I I had the fortunate or unfortunate opportunity to be at your restaurant the last night you were open, and uh, I say that with a heavy heart. I mean, I really do. I, I'm I, if I if I wasn't standing in front of a bunch of cameras, I'd be crying right now. I'm almost crying right now as it is because I know how hard you work, man. I've been there. And to, wow, to see the government shut you down just because you want freedom, the freest nation in the world, the freest nation in the world, and you're shut down by a D.C. mayor because you challenged her. That's what, that's what man, that's what this country's made of. That's what it's made of. You know, it, what's really troubled me is that, is how this administration, how these Democrats have looked at business owners in America as if we don't care about people, whether it's our internal customers, meaning our employees, or our external customers, the one that come in and buy your Big Mac. I mean, I'm sorry, I have Big Mac, that's me, I'm sorry. <laughs> your hamburgers. Uh, but, you know, when I see that, it really gives me a heavy heart when I see what happened. Because 
I can only think of really bad things like communist countries, as I mentioned earlier. And I, I thought we were bigger than that. But the problem is Americans are speaking up. They're seeing that because I was in your shoes not too long ago. And what I mean by your shoes, because you shared this with me that night. And you said, Congressman, I'm going to get this pretty close. You said, Congressman, I never really cared about politics. I served my time in the Navy. I got out. I just wanted to do a, create a job, create a business. And I created this, and I just work hard every day. It was only when government kind of took what I had, that I'd worked so hard for, and took that from me. And now I had to either give up or get involved. And I'm getting involved. And i got to tell you, that's where I was. When I saw time and time again that the biggest competitor that I had was not other restaurants, but was the federal government, I had the opportunity to say, let's get involved. I've had countless people, just as I'm sure you have, is why do you want to get in this fight? It's, maybe you can't save yourself, but you can save so many others. And I know you have garnered a ton of new friends. You've been on national TV talking about this. And I believe it's stories like yours is why we're seeing this great turnaround in America today. You know, as it, as it speaks to the, the oversight of the federal government here in D.C., it's broken. We've seen what happened with, you know, stuff as crazy as the statues that were taken down, the destruction of this great city that's under the purview of the House of Representatives of the, of the, of the Congress be completely decimated of what it indicates and what it shows to people around the world, the stripping away of freedom. This arbitrary use of power, and I'll give you just a classic example. If you look around the room today, there is not a single mask on of anybody in this room. You couldn't have done that yesterday. Just yesterday. You know why? Because all the world, all the national TVs, the global TVs are going to be on the president tonight. And miraculously, the science said on Sunday, we didn't need masks today. That's how arbitrary it is. I believe it was like two days after or three or four days after your restaurant was closed down that it was okay to do exactly what you were doing. That's correct. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? A man who gave 10 years of his life to the military, who put his, all of his savings in a business to only be taken away by a dictator in D.C. It's absolutely uncalled for. It's a disgrace. It is a lack of what we are known for around the world. And we've got to stop that. The American people are speaking up. And it's not just Republicans speaking up. It's Democrats and independents who have had enough of this regime of the Socialist Democrats. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for coming. We really enjoyed having you there. Yeah. And I hope to have you back soon. Really <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Thank you. We want to be back very soon. You know, this has been very, very helpful to our members um, hearing directly from you. This is the People's House. We want to open it back up. We want to hear your voices. You make us better members. We will work harder because the challenges of where we are. And, uh, you know, our goal is always to make tomorrow better than today. And we've had some struggles. It just seems common sense had left government and, and control had taken over. But um, it's very refreshing to hear how you fought back in so many different ways. And... Um, we want to continue to do more of these, and we thank you for the participation. I want to thank the members for participating as well. But uh, this is still the greatest country on earth. Because why? Um, the power rests with all of us. And um, I think what I see happening is